And hi, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Your Money Radio Danny Stewart, Alex Kudis, Don Vader, or Hunter Benzin. Go with you live. Whenever you're listening to the sound of the voices you hear, we're live with you. That's when we are. Danny, I'm going to need you to pay attention today. You can't, I'm, you I'm can't, here. Here. no lollygagging, no, no drifting off. Yep, you don't be it's in a, not a mannequin. It's not a mannequin. Don't be a simulation of a human being today. I need you to pay attention because uh, a lot of a lot of Danny um, content today. I want to talk about. Um, I don't know what to make of the employment report. I don't want to figure it out either. I, you know, the price is the price of whatever's happening in the market. But I do think there are some ramifications coming with the employment report uh, that I want to talk about with you. But I, I want to start with um, what has become my favorite thing of talking to me mommy through the podcast and then she replies back to me sometime during the week and me mommy is hunter's um the beloved grandmother is that that's uh, right is that on your that's your mom's right. side or your dad's side i've never it's asked my mom's. that's my mom your mom your mom's okay that, um and and <laughs> this week uh and then this is all participation because Danny, you don't have to pay attention to this you can just uh, lollygag off for this part if you want i can put my cardboard silhouette of me up and go <laughs> yes you could but let me tell you something me mommy is not a fan of this haircut and i'm gonna i'm gonna go on a limb here and i'm gonna say that me mommy is not a fan of what hunter's doing with his facial hair today just gonna, <laughs> gonna, no, gonna that, throw that out that's there that's not a limb and, it's not a limb she she does not like the facial hair oh okay well i i, I feel like i'm getting to know me mommy through the podcast so if hunter and nicola listen to this by the way me mommy i love you and do not change but the passive aggressiveness in this first sentence is i love it <laughs> I, I absolutely love this basically it's, it's tell tim to tell hunter that <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly what this has become. And I am happy to relay any and all messages. Like this first paragraph might be my favorite me mommy paragraph. If Hunter and Nicolette are happy, and let me tell you something, it doesn't matter what comes next after if Hunter and Nicolette are happy, just know that if Hunter and Nicolette are happy, it really means between the lines, I don't like whatever he's just done. So it doesn't matter what comes after that. It, it it's just if Hunter and Nicolette are happy, but here's how it reads. If but Hunter if they Nicolette, want me also to be happy. Yes, yes, yes. That's exactly what's <laughs> happening here. If Hunter and Nicolette are happy with his haircut, then I'm fine with it. I roll. I'm adding the emphasis. But there is so much. I mean, it's a very short sentence, but how she starts it is so powerful if hunter and Nicolette, yeah yeah and and then i'm i'm fine like it's like when you ask your spouse or your girlfriend are you okay i'm fine like shoulder shot i'm fine no no i know you're not fine can you tell me what's going wrong you pooped on the floor again i'm pretty upset about this like there, there there's the, i'm fine is never a good thing <laughs> let me just coach you up here hunter she is not okay with this okay i just want to let you know so now she does give you a solution Mm -hmm. However, I prefer the photo look is shown below. I am not going to show uh, this picture, but it's it's you and your brothers, and it's adorable. Oh, Why you're not going to show it? What do you mean you're not going to show it? Oh, it, made, okay, it made, of course you're going to show it. He didn't need it. He doesn't have it. Oh. I can't. Next time yeah, you got to you got to save that. Yeah, here. I, I I didn't prepare enough to, to actually show the picture on my computer screen. Which yeah, I I honestly didn't think she that, was a fan so. of the super long. I thought I thought she would appreciate the shorter hair. Uh, no, she prefers yeah, the fuller look. Long. Yeah, the, the, the full prefers, Prince Valiant. Yeah, yeah she's she a wants, Prince Valiant. She's a Prince Valiant. So man. here's the thing, man. You got to shave that facial hair off and let this grow out. I'm on Team Me Mommy. I'm gonna have a T-shirt made. So shave, Mommy. shave the facial hair and don't get a haircut for seven months, and we'll just see what I look like. Yeah, pretend it's a pandemic. Go for so, yeah, the okay. Lord Lord Farquaad look in uh, Shrek. That's that's <laughs> oh, what okay. we want. Yeah, that's exactly. Okay, what I can do that. That's like a so, that's a variant of Prince Valiant. I, I, can't, I can't tell you what my father used to say. He hated facial hair. And I had a really heavy beard. Whenever I'd go to high school to the to the breakfast table, he'd just look at me and shake his head. Oh, hated it. I just I thought um, maybe people maybe people do that to older. this day, Dan. Yep. So the the uh, jobs report came out uh, this morning, and 
Not uh, by any means. I won't even pretend like I, I didn't know what to expect, but it, I probably wouldn't in a million years expected the markets to just all four indices to be up. It was a huge miss. This is the worst miss, Daniel, on a jobs report uh, since 1998. Like this is, it doesn't get much worse that, <laughs> and I mean, you got, you got to go back 20 some years, 20 plus some years to, to find a worse miss. Now, someone could say, well, we're, we're coming out of a pandemic. It's really hard. But it, it's still a pretty bad miss. And then you revised March down uh, 200,000 jobs. And so, which by the way, that just goes to the inaccuracy of this number. This isn't any kind of judgment on any kind of political uh, front. It's just the numbers are awful. Like the plus or minus on these jobs reports is just, it's not even in the oh, ballpark. Six figures. Of course. Six figures yeah. plus or minus. And so it's take it for what it's worth. But the market trades off this information and that can't be denied. But so if it's such a bad jobs report and such a bad miss, why is the market going gangbusters? And I think that's the wrong question to ask. And it's the wrong question to struggle over, uh, in my in my opinion. Um, I think that right now, I think you're going to get status quo. I think that's what the market's interpreting this as. And then the algorithms, how they trade off of information, can't be rewritten fast enough to figure out what to do with the information. I don't think the ramifications of this jobs report are to be felt just yet because right now in this economy, there's 10 million job openings. There, there, there's 10 million job openings. And you, when you say anecdotally, you can't get people back to work. Let's put some, some facts behind it. There are 10, 10, excuse me, 10 million, if I didn't say 10 million, 10 million job openings. And this month, or the, for the last month counted, wages have gone up. 0.7%, which is a huge move in terms of what people are getting paid. And that is it, by the way, that that is, I am, I don't think anybody here, on we are a pro you make more money podcast. Let me just go out on a limb and tell everybody in the free world that we are pro everybody making more money. Okay. We're not against that. Nobody is against that. And the, the work week expanded. Do you remember Daniel, when they were putting through the, um, the Obama care plan and uh, the work week was taken down to like 29 hours so people could qualify 28 for it. Hours, yeah. 28 hours. Work week right now is expanded to 35 hours, which is fantabulous, right? And so you know, people are making more money and their work week has gotten longer. So that's more money in, in Americans' pockets. But then you go to this other, uh, other uh, genre of the job report and you're like, but there's 10 million job openings. And then it's like, well, you got to delve deeper into what this really means. I'll cut to the chase and we'll dive just a little bit deeper here. And it's all going to be uh, everything we're talking about today uh, as I get into a uh, jobs report. And then I want to talk a little stagflation. It's all symbiotic and it all syncs together. So if you're listening, just uh, keep your ears tuned because everything relates and it's all going to come back eventually to the U.S. dollar. Now, so we got 10 million job openings. We've got... Uh, we, we've got wages going up and the wage going up is because you can't get people to work. Well, how do you, how do you know that, Tim? How do you know you can't get people to work? Well, other than you, you read and you see all the bonuses being offered to get people to come in and take shifts at a restaurant or to work at the Walmart or, to, or, or I believe Papa John's is like, a, if you go to Papa John's website, it says like 10,000 jobs are open right now. They need to fill 10,000 jobs. I believe that was on their conference call. Um, and so it, I want to look at, um, let's look at this number here, uh, total unemployed plus marginally attached. Now, these are a lot of words. This is the U6 number. So we get, they get really creative with the jobs report. So uh, the number that's reported on the news is the U3. The U3 number is uh, a measure that's reported everywhere, and it's what is accepted widely as the, the unemployment rate in this country. And Daniel, what is that employment rate? Uh, the, U, the U3 is uh, 6.1 right okay, now. 6.1. So that means uh, only 6% of the of our workforce is unemployed. Is that correct, Daniel? That's how you interpret that. That's well. That's how. Yeah. It, that's the. No, story. do not add any Danny color. There's a Danny yes, color yes, section yes. of the podcast. That's their what. That's what they're reporting. Yes. Okay. Gotcha. Now, as I draw my little marker on the uh, kind of the top left hand side of your screen you'll see a number that says 10.7 there. That, my friends, is what's known as the U6. Daniel, what is the U6 in layman terms? The real unemployment number. Okay, what does that mean? 
Okay, well, so they manipulate the data, and the and the narrower you 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 count things, the the lower the unemployment rate appears to be. So when you allow for certain things, you you cast a broader net. So the U3, if you got discouraged and you've been looking for a job for four weeks and then you go, you know what, I can't find one, I quit. And you're not looking, you don't do an interview, you don't look for a job and after four weeks, they count you as not in the workforce. So you're not counted. Uh, the U6 is, wait a minute, you know, give them a few, let's keep them on there for months because this person is an able-bodied worker and really wanted a job. If you just offered them a job, they would take it. It's just that they got frustrated. That's the first thing. The second thing is they talk about underutilization. Okay, that's um, you, you got discouraged workers, you got underemployment, which means you know an overqualified like an engineer is taking a job, making you know ten or twelve bucks an hour doing something else just because he needs to feed his family and he wants work, and but he's he's not using his skills nearly as much, or he can only find a part time job, not a full time job. So that's okay. the under. The, and then unemployment is the way they count the numbers. So you can see at the top of the uh, of the uh, pandemic, we had a almost 22, 23% U, U6. Like it's a big number. Like the true unemployment rate was in the 20s, 20% range. That's, the, uh, you know, the, hence the stimulus, hence all the actions that uh, the government take. And you can see it's come down here. But there's an issue and it and it dealt and it deals with the labor force participation rate. Now you can pause your screen here, stock nerds and market lovers. Just read that description. I'm not going to read it to you. Just read the labor force participation description. Pause your video right here and then unpause it, and we'll continue on together. Okay. So what there's about that. the people that are just listening? <laughs> I don't want to tell you that they're screwed, but I'm going to give them. I'm going to give them an answer. Of Danny is about to explain it to you. So I wanted people to see it what what you would find on the internet and then i want daniel to talk about it but as daniel go ahead daniel, you tell them tell them what the labor force participation rate is or what it what it really means in layman terms and i want to note that that number right now is 61.7 yeah so the participation rate is the group that they're counting that that's the that's what they're counting and that means 61.7% of the overall population are eligible workers. We're going to count those in the labor force. So that's where they're really going to calculate the unemployment rate. The lower you make that number, meaning the small, the less inclusive, mm -hmm. you're going to make the unemployment rate numbers look better. If when the when the participation rate starts going up, then you're going to make the unemployment rate look higher. And again, they manipulate how they count the numbers, just like they do with inflation. So the participation rate is really how many people are participating in the workforce, actively looking for jobs, how many people are you going to count relative to the total population? So if, we, so if we're just rounding here, uh, 40, almost 40% 40 of our population is not participating in the labor market. Is that correct? Yeah, because they're children, they're retired. Right. Well, they're not counting children. They're they're. Well, no, no, you know that's what I'm saying. You're not. That's yeah. they're not in the participation rate. Right. They're the forty percent. But it's so after you count, take out the retired people and the children, then there's people that are that are our age eligible. They're within the working age, and either they're disabled or that, then after you get past those, then how do you count the rest? Like I said, a discouraged so, worker. Yeah. If he's discouraged after four, three weeks, do you count him, or does it take three months to to not count him in that group? Look at this trend, though. Since 2001, so there's the year 2000. I just circled on the screen. The in 2000, the participation rate was around 67 percent, and now you've got a participation rate at 61.7 percent. They've so you could. Danny tends to lean, and I don't want to get, I don't want to joke around here. Danny, Danny tends to lean that the, the number is manipulated. Let's pretend that the number. Let's just pretend that it's all people retiring. People are getting older. We're not. They're not being replaced by workers. You heard the birth rates down, right? The birth rates at its lowest level ever since it's been reported. That that matters, by the way, um, in terms of being able to. Uh, fuel our economic engine, which drives GDP. We need more bodies in this country working. Um, 
And so, which, which then delves into a whole immigration discussion, which I don't want to get into. But this is really interesting that we, Danny, there's not a labor pool. It would appear that with the participation rate down here, really, I mean, recovering off the lows, but clearly not up here uh, before the pandemic struck, there's not, there might not be enough bodies to fill these 10 million jobs that are open right now in this country. Yeah, the, right, yeah what you're referring to is the birth death rate or the retiring yeah. birth rate. You, you got to take the people moving out and the 18 year olds moving in hmm. or 21 year olds. So now, so now take all that information and well, Tim, how do I use this information to, to shape any of my economic outlook or, or hence make money uh, trading and investing? Well, then that brings me to, um, I want to talk about the dollar here for a second. And so, and, and, and stag, and, and what I think is about to happen, uh, which is stagflation. I don't want to, I don't want to bury the lead here. Uh, and I've been thinking about this, like stagflation has been on my mind. Inflation has been on my mind pretty much most of since February. Uh, and we, and we've darted around the issue with, with stagflation. And I kept thinking, well, why am I doing that? And then, you know, Mark from Buffalo likes to chide me, um, one that, uh, Josh Allen is way better than Carson Wentz. And, that's true. Hundred percent true. <laughs> and he also likes to say, "Man, you are a bear." And I, I, and I know he's joking around, but the best humor always has an element of truth to it. Like the best humor in the world always has like 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 as much truth to it. And so, I think he's right. And, and but I but I wonder where that comes from because it, like. <laughs> you know, like it, indice, uh, you know, if you're just an indice investor, this is your year, you know, like just put it, put it in the indices. And, and I mean, the, gosh almighty, the S and P is up almost 12 for the year. NASDAQ's up six. The diamonds are up 13 for the year. Uh, probably more today. Uh, those were as of yesterday, but like, why am I, why would I have an inkling of bearishness? And I think it uh, evokes back to Danny when I flew helicopters, like we didn't train for bright, sunny skies. Like every time we went up, it was like emergency procedure drills right it was always we're training for doom and gloom and uh what you know it's great if it's a good flight and everything works out and you don't get shot and you don't crash the plane but what happens if it doesn't go right you know what i mean and i think that's driving my outlook here and a lot of that centers on what's happening with the u.s dollar and so don noted it last week and maybe a couple of weeks before like the u.s dollar uh which i've got dxy up here on your screen if you look at the average to range charts, and we, we talk about these all the time, dollar up here uh, peaks at the third ATR, and what happens, uh, this is just around, let me just show you the time frame, give you what I'm talking about here, 331 into the April 1st time frame, and oh, by the way, we'll just mark this time up here, the 38 time frame. Let me bring the Qs. We could use the s and let me bring the Qs up and just show you the exact opposite. So here is, uh, the Qs, and I'll try to get the chart a little bit uh, aligned there. Here's that 353638 time frame. Dollar was peaking there. And what did the Qs do? Yeah, they did a mild rally here, but look at this time right here. Here is 331, 330, 331, and that you know the dollar peaked from that prior chart, and the Qs just kind of take off there. And so the dollar is uh, driving a bunch of these markets, but you really, I think, want to understand what's happening broader scope because i think daniel that stagflation doesn't appear do you know remember that scene anybody remember that scene in austin powers where he's about to get run over by a steamroller but it's really slow and he keeps looking back hasn't hit him keeps looking back hasn't hit him yeah right like i think that's going to be stagflation like you're going to wake up one day and shit just costs more and it's like absorbent and you're not going to know what to do and I, I think I think it's I think we're in the midst of the beginning stages of stagflation. And if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. I don't care. Like I'm not here to be right, but I think that's what is about to take place. And if you understand the origins or or the the workings of stagflation, I had to write this down so I could explain it. I'm going to show you some charts here, and I want to bring this to life. So Daniel, you can correct me if I'm wrong. You can add to it. What triggers stagflation? So higher cost that come from supply shocks. Like these, this is right out of economic textbooks. So what, what can trigger stagflation? Higher costs that come from supply shocks. So if you look at 
Uh, the easiest one to look at here, you can look at sugar, you look at corn, you can look at the old LBS. It's a brand new high, $1,700 for lumber. Look, look at this. Like, uh, is that a supply shock? Do you think that the booming housing economy that's in this country is in a supply shock? The answer is yes. I mean, just look at that chart of lumber. And, and, and so now we don't have enough homes because nobody, like, because they stopped building homes because of a whole host of reasons. Now we don't have enough homes. And someone would say, well, it's scarcity. Uh, but if we just took the tariffs off from Canada, this price would come down. I kind of do believe that, by the way. If the tariffs disappeared from Canadian lumber, we, we'd probably get some relief here. But, but once once price is established, oftentimes, that doesn't mean the consumer will see relief. And what do I mean? The easiest way to explain this is Starbucks. So when coffee, coffee is a, is a commodity that you trade and it vacillates. And when coffee goes lower, Starbucks does not lower their prices at the pump. They charge you, like if it's three bucks for a grande uh, uh, drip coffee, which is what I get, uh, yeah, it's good. Not, they're not gonna lower it. They're just hoping that the price drops and they can hit the bottom line with more profit. That's what Starbucks is hoping for. The price of lumber, I don't think is going to go down. I think that there's new price levels being established for commodities and people are going to attempt, like the warehousers of the world, get their bottom line. So you got supply shocks, Daniel. We have that. I don't want to, we've done this show where I've gone through all the commodities. Okay, but you can think about materials. Well, do we have a supply shock in energy coming? So let's look at crude oil. Let's look at, this is a uh, daily chart of crude oil. Uh, we can put it on a weekly if you want to get a little bit longer of a time frame. There's the big dip, the pandemic. This is a crude oil that bottomed at $6.50. Can somebody do the math? What is the percentage gain from the low to current prices at 60? Thousand. We'll just call it 65. Someone do that for me, please. Thousand. Thousand percent. Yeah. Crude, let me just say that one more time, my <clears throat> friends. Crude oil has increased a thousand percent. Daniel, would you qualify a thousand percent increase in the cost of crude as a supply shock? That that is a pretty good supply shock. I, I would like to say though, it's six and a half. And that's when everybody's locked in COVID. Nobody's traveling. I'd probably use a little bit more of a mean number, but still at 20 or 30, I get you. it's still gone up huge. I get you. No, I'm just gonna mute you for one second. I want to see if it's you. It's you. It's not me, Don, it's you. Or, no, I think I have that backwards. I've heard this enough at the prom. It's not you, it's me. Whatever, <laughs> your mic was scratching. So, hey, Tim. Go ahead. Um, so, I don't know if 6.5 indicates what really happened because oil futures went negative overnight yeah. on that Sunday. Oh, yeah. I, I don't even want to. I know what you're saying, and, and that's not. I, I understand exactly. It, it's alluding even more to your point. Yeah, yep. Yeah. So yeah. you have an energy shock here. Oil, I mean, excuse me, gasoline now is, it's not averaging $5 a gallon in Los Angeles, but it's, cre you have $5 gas in Los Angeles at a few places, but it's between 450 and five right now. That, to my knowledge, hasn't happened since I lived out there in, uh, from 08 through uh, 2011. Yeah, and it's around three here in Texas, right, Tim? It's three. Yeah, it, it's it's creeping up there. Two two seventy is the late, latest price. Uh, Not what it is here. Two seventy two eighty. And, and <laughs> so, just think about the energy uh, in this country the way it is right now. So, the reason why the refiners are taking off, there's a whole host of reasons, but but when you put more restrictions on the people that pump the petroleum, you put it you put a scarcity on that commodity. OK, and there's good, there's more environmental restrictions coming down the pike than than before. And that happens when administrations change. And so it doesn't have to, you know, it goes both ways. And so you have the energy shock. Now, Daniel, there's another there's another issue that can affect that that hasn't come yet, but it's coming. And that's taxes. Taxes are raising or uh, not a lowering, but uh, you raise taxes, which is costing people more money they have less money to put in the economy in addition to these uh rising inputs that we just talked about will have an effect but it's this next one daniel 
this next one that is absolutely the one I think that has us tripped into the beginning stages of stagflation, the rapid growth of the money supply. <laughs> and if I was smart, I would have had a chart of the money supply. And I'll, uh, and I'll try to- uh, it, it, it looks like lumber, probably yeah. even steeper. It's probably, let me go this way. So it's when you, it's a if, if I'm just going to describe it to you through audible words and try to paint you a picture and play theater of the mind, we had um, uh, uh, we had a money supply that looked this big. If you're listening at home, we had a money supply. We'll just use the number ten. The money supply was at a number ten. The money supply after three is it three or four rounds of stimulus? Four. Uh, you mean since you mean well yeah, they had the one. Midway Wars. through COVID with Trump the last year, then they had uh, yeah. Biden's. They did a couple of little, they had one big four one. Four stimulus. One. So after four rounds of stimulus, the money supply is now at a thousand. It was at a 10, and now it's at a thousand. They've increased the money supply exponentially. And so, well, what, what does that, what does that do? It's, it's so many dollars. Now, this is the part, and, and Alex has actually tripped onto this too. Like, Peyton, what's wrong with the IPO process? Or, or, or it w then, which led to the discussion about venture capital, and we were talking about SPACs. It all ties together here, my friends. So, too many dollars chasing too few goods leads to an inflation in what? Housing, materials. Think about venture capital deals. Is what when when they brought? Think, give me, um, give me a SPAC. Anyone, any SPAC? CCIB. Or what, what was that? that? Bfly. Did BFly, we'll get this on a daily chart, really deserve the valuation it received when it came public and peaked at $29? Or, or are there so many dollars out there because of artific artificially low interest rates are what they are. You want to call them artificial, call them artificial. Because of interest rates that are so low, are there too few dollars chasing too few business deals like BFly or Civic or Ride or, well, Nicola's got its own set of issues. And maybe they don't deserve that valuation that they receive in the in the private markets. And so that when they come public and try to dump B fly on you at 29, you you wake up the next day and you're an investor at 36 or at 1236. There's so many dollars chasing a scarcity right now. So when you go to buy a home, so Daniel, Tanya and I are thinking of uh, uh, either adding an addition to the home potentially or just moving there's nowhere to move to <laughs> so they've got you drive through texas i don't know if it's like that in florida or yeah. arizona alex you drive through uh where daniel and i and the genre of Dan, where danny and i live it's construction site after i mean it, it's like trucks and trucks and trucks and trucks it's like all over man like all the bob the builders are out there making homes so to get daniel i didn't know this till um this week to Get one of those new construction homes. You you can go in with an agent, go in by yourself. It's not going to help you. You get your name into a raffle. So when a new home comes up, they they you 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 can you they literally have to draw your name. There's so many like they're all sold out. They have so much demand. Some of you might call that a bubble. I don't know if it's a bubble, and I don't and I'm not being facetious. Like like of course it's a bubble. No, no, no. It's just there's so many dollars. That, let's 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 codify this again. There's so many dollars chasing too few assets. We had uh we had a couple contractors come by uh, in the evening to take a look and say, oh yeah, you could you could do this, you could do this. Uh, and one of them said, hey, man, I I can't get lumber in, and and I understand lumber uh, pretty well. And and he said, I I I had to get a new truck because mine mine broke down, and I had to take whatever they had on the lot. They don't, there's no trucks. Oh, it's hard. Yes, it's true. There are. Uh, the phrase that sticks out to me when you're talking about are we in the beginning stages of stagflation? There's too few dollars chasing too few goods. And so let's look at the dollar and just look at what's happening here. So the U.S. dollar now, can, it's not all bad, and it doesn't mean that uh, the economy is going to fall off to hell in a handbasket. You're just going to wake up one day, and eventually, 
I think you're just in the soup. And we're going to delve a little bit deeper in this. But look at this dollar. The dollar has fallen off a cliff today. Like someone's going, like, Tim, falling off a cliff. You're off your rocker. It's down six tenths of a percent. What do you mean falling off? Just look at this. I, I know if you're listening at home, imagine Wiley Coyote falling off of a cliff. That's what the dollar has done. I mean, this dollar can't gain any strength. And that that is a big deal. That's great. That, that's great for our companies and our S&P. And this is why I don't know if the market has completely figured this out yet. And by the way, it doesn't matter. Uh, that, that sounded so arrogant the way I said it. Well, the market hasn't come around to my way of thinking. That's not the way I meant it at all. I don't know if the market is absolutely quantified what this dollar move means because when you have this dollar so low it's great for our export companies s p 500 type companies that export but daniel what do we make in this country anymore <laughs> nothing not much by percentage Trump. nothing so conversely if it's great for exporting it is insanely horrible for importing. So, so the lower the dollar goes, the more it costs to import goods. The more, yeah. so, so prices are going to rise. You've got taxes that are going to go up. And, and your buying power as a participant in the U.S. dollar is going to fall if the dollar keeps going as low as it's going. I, I think we're getting there. And I've got some more to share with you, Danny, but I think you want to jump in. So go ahead. Well, I, you know, I want to make a couple points. Number one, um, the, so the Treasury, they quadrupled their estimates just from like a month and a half ago of what they need over the next couple of months. The budget for the first, the, our fiscal court year starts at the end of October of each year. It's not a calendar year. And so for the first, first half of the year, it's the biggest deficit on record ever. And they're proposing another four trillion dollars. If they do that, then you're talking about the deficit will be as as big in this one single year than any four-year term of a president. It's gonna, the deficit's going to be just massive. It's it's going to be ridiculous. That's one reason the dollar is falling. Now, one other thing I'd like to say about that, you know, I, I know what you said about it's being good for exports and all that stuff, and that mm -hmm. is. That is what they teach with economics, and that is good in the short term. Right. But for the long term health of an economy and a country, you want a stable currency. Weakening the the current, weakening the the dollar and devaluing your currency is like a B12 shot. It make you feel good right away, but it's it's really better to eat healthy and run and not try to goose yourself up. And and right. because because you're right, it's about the American consumer and it's about the people. That are consuming those products so if you have a stable currency it even helps those exporters long term maybe in the short term they get a little bit of an edge but we are now printing money uh with and if they get the velocity of money turning over so if they start getting a jump start and making the economy go you, then you're really going to see inflation so right now you were talking about some supply disruptions from the chips and everything goes in those computer chips. That's one reason they can't get the cars. But you TVs are about to go up. I just bought a couple TVs for my house because they're about to go up 20, 20%. The new filing TVs like toilet paper. What's going on in this stored household? Well, I needed some anyway, but I'm internet challenged out where I live. Oh, hold on, Don. Hold on. Turn yourself back on. I can't I for some reason I can't click you back on. What'd you say? You didn't get an invite to the opening of Dan's sports bar? Yeah, yeah, I thought I thought you said he was going to wipe all his bull riding all the time. Yeah, we got one of those like uh, Urban Cowboy. We got one of those electrical bulls. Oh, all it shows is Urban Cowboy with John Travolta. It's three televisions of one movie. Bud and Sissy. It's but, uh, uh, but, but yeah, anyway, I know you're done with that joke. But look, just look at the here. I put up gasoline futures because you mentioned cars. I Here sent you a, a little screenshot, a picture of all the prices yeah. that have gone up, commodities. You know what yep. the number one was, Tim? Your favorite, bacon. Yep. Pork Look bellies. at this on 11.2. So gasoline prices right before like the election, prices. kind of bottom out here. Can someone do the percentage of $1? We'll just use this midpoint here. $1.03 and three cents to 2.12. Uh, what is what is that percentage gain? 105%. Yeah. 
And that's what I'm talking about. That right there is a direct tax on the American consumer without having to ever go through Congress. Yep. That, that, that right there is the biggest, and, and by the way, Uber talked about this on their conference call, uh, like the cost of an Uber has gone up. They don't have enough drivers to begin with. They're not even, they're, 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 they're 1099 employees to be, they're not even real employees, which is sad. Uh, and all these, I think that's going to be the next thing that falls, like the Ubers and the Lyfts. They're going to have to have real employees. They're not going to be allowed to co call them contractors, even though what the state of California uh, passed last uh, election cycle. Uh, I think it's going to come down from the federal level, but that's just a prediction. Um, but because you know, there's so, and, and someone might say, well, let me just follow up that thought. Well, why would that come down from on high? Because th what what this administration wants to do is bolster the IRS budget because the IRS budget has been uh, depleted over the years and they're, they can gain a tremendous amount of money back from just unpaid taxes. And I don't know the study, but if uh, you have a choice to send a check to the government as a 1099 employee or not, you're probably, you know, like if you're, if you're debating that, and I don't screw with taxes like that, but you know, if you don't have your taxes taken out of your paycheck right away, there's probably a good portion of that that's going unpaid, making it way after you once you become an employee, but I digress. The cost of getting to work has gone up extraordinarily. And that is something that needs to be, it has to be contended with. Wages need to be this level. I just told you that wages went up on average 0.7%. Gasoline went up since last November, 105%. That hits people right in the pocketbook. They're not, the wages are not going to get the escape velocity from all the other inputs. Trying to feed your family, trying to put tires, you don't, you don't think the cost of rubber is going to go up. The whole apparatus right now is, is burdened by this inflation. And, I, and, it, and if you just look at the state of the US dollar, it, it's insane. Like the, the amount of money in the system, and, and we've kind of touched on it last week, Danny, the only way to like the only way to stop this is to take you start taking dollars out of the system that's going to do what raise rates and if you raise rates i think that kills this market i don't know what let me just say I, i'm not 100% sure what the answer is but let me let me show you how it started and i'm going to i'm going to let you ponder what could be the answer danny or where you think this is going and then we'll we'll get into the rest of the normal show as i try to pick up my pencil without anybody knowing that i dropped it <laughs> I'm back. Um, let me show you this chart here. So this is what I think is super interesting. So uh, can you fellas see my screen where it says macrotrends.net? What I have up here is, um, and let me pull you guys up here so I can see. What I have on this chart is uh, the presidential, the presidents, you can see all the, all the way back to Hoover and what, what took place in their term and it's super interesting because i i uh will often refer to everybody does i think stagflation is just jimmy carter okay and let me just trace over this line this is jimmy carter's presidency so i've got jimmy carter selected he's often pegged with stagflation and a whole bunch of other things and let me just show you uh as i click here energize this chart so you bring Carter down and you can see Carter starts his presidency and the stock market's like, we don't like any of this. Down 5.8%, tries to recover. And eventually he hits almost down 15%, 13 months into his presidency. You can see the number 13 there and you can see the percentages of his presidency is down. Eventually he rebounds. He, it, I mean, this is a hell of a rebound, right? From negative 13 to plus, to, to plus 37. Anyway, you balance it out. He eventually ends his presidency. The S&P 500 is up about 1.25%. Okay? Yeah, right. We got with double-digit inflation, so you have double-digit inflation. Yeah, yeah. So, 12% loss. And yeah, so let me show you, though, where the problem really started. Richard Nixon. And so Nixon gets, uh, we'll take Carter off of here and look at what, what happens to Nixon. Now you can say that's Watergate, that's a whole bunch of other things. But Danny, the, the really interesting thing about Nixon is, and I, I think you're gonna get it, what did Nixon do in the first term of his presidency? Uh, took us off the gold standard, one thing. 
Man, I knew you would know that. Oh, Danny, Danny, five, Danny. So he, he, where's the smile, Dan? Come on. The vote, he knows. No, Danny. 1971, baby. Nailed it to the month. Bada bing. If you can, so if you can see here, Nixon area, Whoa. don't pay attention to this nonsense. Is there a vacuum cleaner going off in the background somewhere? I don't know what that was. I don't know, like a motorcycle, perhaps. Interesting. Okay, so I think that was my I think that was outside of my my place. Oh, I got you. So um, it's it's uh, taking us off the gold standard. <laughs> the move ignited a run on the dollar, which devalued and hurt uh, oil barons and and whatnot. But it's this right here: root cause remains underlying issues of economic policy that devalued the dollar. The root cause remains the underlying issues of economic policy that devalue the dollar. And so if the dollar, there comes a point, I believe, that where the dollar gets to be too low, that it actually is a hindrance. Like it's no longer great for the exporters. It's like, wait a minute, we're, in, we're a country that imports our goods. We're a country that, that has less buying power. And I think that it starts to hurt. I, I, and and so in a market, when someone will say to me, and this happens not often, but often enough that I that I recall it, you know, hey, the market's rigged. But yeah, the market's rigged. You just have to know how. And the market's rigged by algorithms. Like they trade in front of you. You know, like it's it, it's no different than order flow being sold by Robinhood. Uh, right and wrong or indifferent, it's what's happening. The algorithm. You can't trade fast like the algorithms can. And so. Right now, the algorithms are programmed by humans, and the textbooks say, well, when the dollar goes lower, that's great for uh, our exporters. But there's going to come a point in time where I think if, if something isn't done, you're going to see, if not a Nixon-esque uh, move, uh, a Carter-esque move. And then, and then you're going to, I mean, how do you, you have to raise yourself out of that eventually, right? Danny, what do you think? Well, you know, it's kind of funny because the, 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 you know, stagflation, the, the, everybody thinks stagflation. Stagflation is when you actually have inflation and a faltering economy. You're not growing right. and you're not, it's kind of stagnant. And that's where they get the, the word stagflation. And it's, it's the best, of, it's the worst of both worlds because you can't kind of get yourself traction and you can't get out there and make a lot of money to cover the cost of inflation. Well, let me just pause you one second because I want to make sure I tie a point very vividly because someone in our listening audience might say, well, the economy is booming, Tim. That's the thing you're missing. I'm thinking that if things cost too much, we stop spending. And we're a nation of spenders. And if we're not spending, the wheels kind of stop turning. Continue on, Danny. That's well, I, I would I would take you know, umbrage with that statement. The economy is booming. We we came from a flat line zero because we forced our country to shut down completely and shut down. And then we said, okay, we can start opening up. And then right. the government sent us a two trillion dollars of funny money to go spend to start it getting going. So it's hard to replace real growth. It's hard to replace stimulus or funny money, printed money, inflation money with real growth. You you mm -hmm. use the word terminal velocity earlier. Are we going to hit that terminal velocity? So that's the problem. So you were talking about Carter, you know, they had a thing called the misery index back in the 70s. Okay. A guy actually came up with it. The guy that came up with the idea uh, was actually in the 60s during Johnson, but it really came up during Carter. And he was looking at adding the inflation rate um, <clears throat> along with the unemployment rate. Mm -hmm. And you'd add those two together and that would give you a number. And as long as you're in the mid single digits, six, seven, eight, you're okay. You know, seven, six to seven and a half, eight. Once you start getting above that, people get missed. That's a bad number. It's miserable. And so you get above that and presidents get kicked out of office for that. They don't, they don't make it. And so that's one thing they pay attention to. Carter's got up in the, in the, in the mid teens, it was tough because inflation got so high. Um, um, and that makes it tough. Now, I can make an argument both ways. So if they tax us too much and take money out of the take money out of our pockets to help drive the economy and stimulate real growth, and then they have other policies that aren't pro-growth that don't help the economy, they could slow it down where it might not be as bad. But I'll tell you what, if they get the velocity of money turning over and, and the economy does pick up on its own. You start getting any kind of momentum, you're going to see 
big inflation. You're not going to be three, four, five. You're going to see, you know, you're going to see eight or 10 easily. And once that gets out of the barn, people start to, it, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy because people go, oh my gosh, you start to panic and they go start buying stuff because they think it's going to be more expensive in two months. And so, and when that happens, store owners and people that have inventory, they will hold their inventory because they make more money by holding it, letting it go up in price than they do selling it. So then it causes shortages. It's almost like a short squeeze in a stock. It, it, it has a, it has, it snowballs on itself. You know, it's, it's funny. So you remember Yellen last, this Tuesday stepped in it. She said, well, interest rates may necessarily have to rise some to make sure the economy doesn't overheat. The market immediately rolled over, started selling off. So they got her on the bat phone and they said, Hey, take back that comment, you moron. What are you saying? And so she had to clarify and say, well, you know, we don't, you know, I'm not really that worried about inflation. We're not, I, I didn't really mean to, say that interest rates are going to rise. So she kind of had to walk it back a little bit later and the market kind of got relieved a little bit. But right now the Fed is 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 getting closer to losing control where long-term rates may rise anyway, even if they try to buy bonds because mm -hmm. they don't they control the short-term rates, not the long-term. So we're going to have one of two outcomes. It's not going to be an even level, smooth ride, you're going to either get the economy really faltering, we go into a recession, which may dampen inflation, but with this amount of printing, we're going to get some, or we get lots of inflation. If that happens, you need certain asset groups. Bonds will get slaughtered. They got slaughtered, slaughtered in the 70s. They were down 30, 35, 40. The treasury bonds were down over 30% in the 70s, okay? Stocks were also down, especially when you adjust for inflation. The only game in town during the 70s was commodities and precious metals, which is a type of commodity also. In fact, they've actually done a study where if you're a buy and hold pie chart person, where you take 50% stocks, 50% bonds, right? And that's your baseline portfolio. Then you cut out 20% and you so you got 40 and 40 stocks and bonds and one portfolio, portfolio number one test, would have 20% real estate. The second one would have 20% private equity. The third one had 20% hedge funds. And the last one had gold and, gold and commodities. The one that had the best overall return for a 30 year period and the highest sharps ratio was the one with commodities. Real estate was a little bit behind. Private equity and hedge funds were way down the list. Why? Because they were so correlated to either the stock or the bond market. But when they looked down, did a deep dive into those numbers, they realized what it was, was when it really hit the fan in both stocks and commodities, I mean, bonds did terrible. That's when you needed that thing. And that was the 1970s time period. So, you know, there's certain times that bonds are not going to be your aunt. That's not going to be your safety. And the Fed is printing so much money now, there is no such thing as a safe asset anymore. Let me repeat that. There's no such thing as a safe asset because on a fixed CD or a money market or a uber short-term treasury bond, investment-grade bond fund, you're only getting what you're not keeping up with inflation. You're losing purchasing power every day. So you're going to have to deal with the cards you're dealt. Tim, like you said, yes, it's rigged, but you gotta, you got to just got to understand how it's rigged. And that's the same thing. You've got to know how to adjust. And you're either on this outcome you're you're most if I had to get I mean I'm going to follow the charts but it's probably about a 70 percent probability that you're going to need inflation type assets going forward but if they do some really if they make a wrong turn and really do some stuff that's not real smart they could cause a big recession and in that case you need a whole different asset group one one last point and then we'll move on to uh the normal show um this could go question away for you. Oh, okay. Once, just one you, second. You can this go ahead and say what you're going to say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah go this, ahead. this all goes away. I this could not all go away, but a lot of it goes away at the end of September when uh, federal unemployment is, if they eliminate federal the, the the kicker from federal unemployment that they have added for the pandemic, will taking that away be enough to get people to come off the sidelines that can work to want to work, and that that might. That might factor into uh, the fourth quarter 
and how how markets take things. So go, go ahead, Hunter. What you got? Uh, my my question is, you know, based on everything that you guys just discussed, does that possibly force U.S. companies to strongly consider earlier adoption of decentralized digital currencies, uh, maybe more so than they would have considered previously, or at least faster? Yeah. U.S. dollars are a melting ice cap, in my it's my opinion. I don't know if they go crypto, but they might go asset. But like, there's a reason why there's a boom in crypto, uh, non-fungible tokens, which is based on Ethereum, or uh, art, automobiles, doggies, or um, or uh, uh, sports cards. Like alternative assets, I believe yes. are big because because they're appreciating assets uh, in theory. Whereas the U.S. dollar right now with inflation is, uh, as Danny would say, I believe, is a guaranteed to go down, right? Well, yeah, they're, they got a Hobson choice now. It's hard to turn around and reverse course as leverage works both ways. So they, if they start pulling money out, they'll definitely make the thing collapse. And if they do that, they're out of office and these guys are politicians. They do not want to be the one uh, holding the bag. And to your point about that unemployment number was so bad. Because right now the government is paying people more to stay at home than they are to go to work. So a lot of people that have that attitude say, well, why would I go work for less when I can stay at home and get less and get more? Well, and, and then but hold on. It's, I don't know how nefarious. Everyone's you're not doing this. And I want to be really clear. I'm not. A, this is not accusatory. When you factor in the cost right now of just getting to work. They. I don't think getting to work is a cheap proposition right now. Like, it, like how, like getting the car. Get, right now, McDonald's in Florida is paying people forty bucks just to come to to interview. That's yeah. how bad they want it, and they're raising their minimum wages everywhere. There's a couple states that have now said, "We've got so many job openings, we need employer employees. We're taking away the state portion of it. The federal still yeah. paying you their extra kicker." But we're taking away our state kicker because we want people to go back to work. Yeah, um, the Chamber of Commerce came out today after that number and said, please, please dial back the enhanced unemployment if you want people to go back to work. But something I uh, my son in law told me about is effective July 1st, people at a certain income level are going to start receiving a three hundred dollar check for each child that they have. Uh, oh. And he said he he's a. Uh, he said to my son-in-law, so I'm giving you my notice. I'm leaving. I have 12 kids. I'm leaving July 1st. Why should he work when he's getting $3,600 a month from uh, the government? I have not heard anybody talking about this, and I actually didn't believe it, but I looked it up in $300 a month cash per child, what's the, effective what's July the, 1st. What's the income level that to qualify? I, you know? I don't know. Okay. You're thinking of uh, you okay, okay. you're gonna kids? adopt a bunch yeah. of kids, Hunter? All of a sudden, I'm just gonna snatch some up. I mean, wherever I can get them, it doesn't matter. <laughs> All right, uh, let's do some research. Alternative folks. assets, children. <laughs> yeah, yes, uh, alternative assets are children. Um, let's do some research. What you got, Hunter? Uh, well, I mean, a, a lot of this plays hand in hand with what you guys just went over. And uh, Tim, pull up a chart of of old NUE Nucor. Yeah. We go oh it's the chart of lumber yeah i mean we just everything you guys said about you know weaker dollar benefiting exports and inflation and here you go with nucor uh just the steel group as a whole has been strong making relative strength new highs but nucor appears to be the clear leader uh just stronger than than most of their peers the other one in the group is stld it looks relatively similar to Nucor. Um, and so it, they're, both of these are pretty extended right now. Obviously, you know, no one knows. They could, they could run up another 10 points before they even pull back. Uh, but I would just, I know I, I talked about these, I think for maybe a week or two in a row as Nucor had a really nice consolidation to the 21 before it broke out. And STLD was pretty similar, uh, but Nucor just kind of held up better after a big move. And here they are finally catching some steam and rolling. Uh, so, and I, is that a like right at the tip top of the third ATR right there, Tim? Uh, beyond it, beyond it. You you would probably be at a fourth or fifth ATR at this point. Yeah. So, 
I, we might want to consider taking some profits if you own it right here and you and you've ran up a lot over the last i mean what's that a six day rally really almost 20 percent in six days right. so just really strong and then uh two other ones uh fang which is owned in-house uh just reported earnings a few days ago they went they were down about five or six percent but really right to the 21 at a strong bounce and uh then today they reversed higher I, Fang was down two, two and a half, almost 3% earlier this morning. Now it's up 2%. Uh, I think this is a really interesting chart. And there's a, there's a couple of oil stocks, a handful really, that look pretty similar to what Fang looks like. Uh, but you can also pull up XOP is the, the ETF that almost kind of mimics what Fang looks like here too. And so if oil is, is to benefit from inflation, if, if oil prices continue higher, which pull up, pull up that chart of oil that you had, Tim. What would you say about that chart? Would you say that's a bullish chart for oil to go uh, higher? There's there, there's very few commodity charts that aren't bullish. They're all bullish. It's just time in your entry. Yeah. So, I mean, that's just NUB, STLD, two that are extended, uh, that have been incredibly strong. XOP and FANG are viable. I mean, who's, it wouldn't surprise me if they go on a, a, a new core type run over the next couple of weeks if oil prices do move higher. And then the last thing, uh, I already touched on it a little bit. Can you pull up the chart of Bitcoin, Tim? Oh, yeah. I, I like this chart. This chart is my favorite is chart. chart. You can yeah. trade the 21 off of Bitcoin. Like the the mean. I'm sorry. This is what I wanted to say. Right yeah. So I, I told Alex, uh, I mean, everything you just said, why would you, like, if you're, if you're company XYZ and you got 10 billion in cash, I mean, why would you not at least think about possibly having some and some other asset that at least has yeah. a chance at appreciating? I yeah. mean, you're you're losing money. You're losing buying power uh, if you're just holding U.S. dollars, just sitting in cash in a bank account or something, you know. So I, I think Bitcoin is really interesting, and this is the primary reason why. You talked about Dogecoin. Ethereum's been on a massive run. It's been outperforming Bitcoin. I saw a chart or a list of, of cryptocurrency returns the other day. And there's probably 10 on there and Bitcoin had the lowest return out of any of them year to date. And so I feel like Bitcoin is kind of being ignored and forgotten about a little bit with all the speculation with Dogecoin and Ethereum's been kicking its ass, uh, which maybe I, I wonder think if, is good for Bitcoin Elon is to get, get ready. Yeah, I, I, I think that um, there is a chance that uh, this was the peak of Doge uh, or somewhere around Elon's appearance on Saturday Night Live. and I wonder if this That's is tomorrow, isn't it? Yeah, tomorrow. Yeah. Come, yeah. But I wonder if the S and C. Uh, I know Gary Gensler did an interview today, and I don't think he touched on it. But when does the SEC start talking about um, social media and uh, pumping of things, whether it's a joke or not? Um, I wonder in the near future if the SEC starts. In, um, I don't even know about enforcing. I don't know what rule they would enforce, but questioning what what's taking place um i mean there's no value like i'm not anti-doge like look it, it's real money like if you put all three stimulus checks into dogecoin i believe you're up like three or four hundred thousand dollars like yeah. it's yeah like it, it's not they don't they don't give a rat's behind at target how you made your money so i'm always pro people making money but i i don't know the value of doge other than cashing it out like i don't know the value and someone would say, well, Tim, what are you buying with Bitcoin? I, I think the same thing of gold, by the way. Daniel will tell you gold has, yeah. I'm not looking for a history of gold, Daniel. I just want to say that at the start of this. But if I have to go out and buy bread with a bar of gold, I'm almost certain in this country we have more problems than, than me having to go buy a loaf of bread with a bar of gold. So like it's just a store of value and Bitcoin, I guess you could say is now new gold. Ethereum has use cases with non-fungible tokens, which have an absolute ability to affect, if you want to talk about the art world, not so much as painting, as which it has, but artist in terms of music, uh, a lot of people don't realize this, that Spotify pays you half a penny, like one half of a cent per stream. That's re It's really hard to make money as an artist if your music is streamed. You're like, well, it's great, you're streaming music. No, 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 no you're getting half a penny a stream. So you can do the math on how many streams you would need to actually earn a living doing that. Apple, believe it or not, doubles that. They pay you a whole penny per stream. 
And now artists with the Ethereum advancements can actually just sell you the song. They can sell you the catalog. Like they're, they're, no middleman, no middleman needed. You know, they can just issue a token and maybe, maybe there's a middleman in terms of um, the, the service that provides the wallet and whatnot. But uh, I think there's more, I, I think Ethereum's a $10,000 product. Let me just go out there and say, I think what's Ethereum right now? 3,600, 3,500? 30, 30, 35, 36, yeah. Yeah, I think Ethereum's a $10,000 product, maybe next year. Who knows? I think there's more use case for Ethereum the way it's been designed than there are uh, maybe Bitcoin. And it's interesting, like, well, MSTR, like you mentioned the companies that have put their money in, um, in the old Bitster. Like, look at MSTR. Uh, this chart is not recovered. Like, uh, Elon uh, with Tesla has not really, um, I mean, th this is underperformance. While, while, I mean, if you want to, they're not tracked directly to Bitcoin, but I don't know how much they're uh, helping either, per se. So well, there was a time, a pretty extended period of time, where MSTR was pretty correlated to Bitcoin, and there yeah. was a, also a significant period of time where they would outperform Bitcoin on any day Bitcoin was up uh, for a while. Like Bitcoin's up ten percent, MSTR's up fifteen, and there was also at, in that same time frame they would be down less than Bitcoin on down days i didn't obviously that hasn't lasted and mstr is, is now you know does not look as good as bitcoin but uh it was a an odd time there with mstr si was similar not not as much but that was that was, and i guess that was in the fourth quarter of last year going into like november december that, that trend is definitely broken and i believe in 2021 and i know not through history of time but 2021 gm has outperformed tesla and ford i believe has outperformed tesla i'd have to I don't want to waste time pulling up those charts, but I, I believe that is the case. What else you got, Hunter? That's all I got. I was uh, going to defer to Alex on some technical analysis on uh, on Bitcoin. I think he's he mentioned a power of three. Oh. The, the moving Let's averages had started to converge there. So uh, it, Alex. he's been following it closely. You there, buddy? Yeah, so one of my favorite setups is when the 50-day... 21 EMA, and you could use the 10 day SMA or the eight EMA. I use the eight. Um, I think you have the eight. Yeah, see, uh, when those converge and are hooking sideways to give a stock or an asset, whatever, whatever you're buying a support, that to me is a very bullish signal. And I want to allude to something Dogecoin has 90 billion coins in their float. Mm -hmm. They're issuing five, I think it's five billion or five million a month now into the market. So what happens with supply and demand, Tim? Yeah. 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 Is, so it's gonna Bitcoin has 19.5 million in the float and that's it. That's all that will ever be. So as institutions are now issuing that on their books, what's going to happen to price? It's a simple supply and demand thing. Uh, Bitcoin is almost Berkshire Hathaway on split, right? Like when you look at, like they'll never split the stock. So BRKB has an infinite amount of shares. That's all, all they'll ever be. They're not going to issue more. Um, or BRKA, excuse me, the A shares. And Yeah, you can't do that with a, that, uh, that digital asset. I don't think so. No, not 100%. But I mean, yeah, but I think that's, I think it's very plausible that you see six figures in Bitcoin. Yeah, it, it's the, the case is there, where we're going, um, some of the points you guys brought up. Another theme I, want, I would like you to pull up is the weekly chart on gold, GLD. Mm -hmm. So- we talked about gold on Wednesday. Let's get the weekly on. Yeah, there's something I want to- are you talking about that, gold, the stock, or gold? No, no, no. I, want to, I want to go over the actual gold first. Um, so I use this, and it's from an old method. Uh, this great trader, Stan Weinstein, has a book. You can buy it. It's, it's called uh, Secrets for Profiting in Bull and Bear Markets. And one of the, the, the methods that he uses is a weekly chart on a beat-up name, and you use the 30-week moving average as a way to get in. And I saw that kind of hooking up on the right side. I'm like, all right, the asset's working. I don't necessarily want to buy gold straight up. What mining company or, or what, what can I get in 
to maximize gains. So I got into gold, Barrick Gold yesterday. They had reported earnings this week, didn't really do much. And then yesterday morning, if you can pull up the daily on this one, uh, I decided to, to buy some and it worked out. Now this, I'm thinking like oil and some of the assets that you guys are talking about could be a super cycle play. Now we in Grotection got into SIL, right, Don? Yeah. And same thing. And if this works out, you could potentially have a longer position um, and a super cycle move in an inflationary period like oil, where this could yield some nice profits. It's also a lower risk. You know, we're not getting the tech's not working right now. And someone mentioned this, I think, on Twitter and thought it was really brilliant. Uh, the, the guy said we were in a stealth correction. And I, I think that there's no better word for that because the indexes are at all time highs, yet these growth stocks got absolutely just crushed, as we know. But there are some themes working, and I think this could potentially be one of them. Another theme that capitalizes on mining and, the, and gold and silver is Caterpillar. And also they are exposed to the construction, obviously. And this is setting up. We got into this today. We put a position on. And uh, looks good, setting up a nice base. It's not, it's not even extended. Look at that. Is that the mean average right there on that? The, is that the one ATR right there? It's at. Yeah. yeah. So it just broke. It just bounced right off that. So these are themes that we're we're looking at and focusing on and researching. And uh, that's it for me. Okay, uh, Don, you got the video tonight. Twenty one over twenty one. Uh, a lot of people serve it as their watch list or use it as their watch list. Pardon me uh and you big turnover moves. big turnover yeah. in it this week at least uh 10 names coming off of it uh, I'll tell you what, give me give me a preview of the remix as r kelly would say the remix the remix is gonna <laughs> is gonna think you, uh it's gonna look like it's uh 1999 it, and not not all these are gonna be on it but a, a couple of them will but when you've got uh high pe tech stocks that get smashed mm -hmm. uh portfolio managers can't just abandon tech they have to have an allocation to tech so what do they do they look for cheap tech and a lot of money is flowing into big names from uh 1999 2000 like cisco uh -huh. dell juniper oracle ibm oh let's look at that you know what I, that ibm charts actually uh consolidating in highs I yeah, believe, and right? these yeah. these things were immune yep. to the uh, mid mid uh, February sell off. So uh, when you need a tech allocation and you're nervous about tech, you go to low PEs, and that's what you find in these uh, stocks. A lot of nice looking charts in here. Cool, cool. Is that is that the preview of uh, the twenty one over twenty one? Yeah, um, and some things that we bought this week are going to go on it, like uh, Caterpillar. Dell is going to go on it. Um, that's a look but, at that chart of Dell. Off the, that's a really nice looking chart. You know, can I just uh, pause for one second? When you pull up a chart, folks, and you look at it for a second, it either hits or it doesn't. That chart hits right there. Nice looking chart. Some some things that are uh, coming off are some of the last survivors from. Uh, the big growth run, things like Net, which got smacked hard the day before earnings, reclaiming barely half of it today. But uh, these things were forming the right side of their bases as we came into that eight-week eight week period since the correction started in growth stocks. And the thought was that that was the time to firm out the bases and probably break out if earnings were accepted. But that's the exact opposite of what happened. So things coming off of it are uh, Net, um, Tesla. Oh yeah. Snap. Yeah. And uh a lesson for always sticking to your stops, TDC, which I uh bought on a gap up after it pre-announced. And uh once it broke the eight and the low of the gap up, I sold it. And then you think that you'd be safe going into earnings two weeks after you pre-announce. They lowered what they pre-announced during their earnings run. Can we just pause there for a second? I didn't know that's what happened. Why? Like, okay, there are a couple internal accounts that need to get fired. 
I well, think no, that there's probably going to be some class action lawsuits. I would, I, yeah, like, like, why would you pre that? That is real no, money. Like, I'm sorry. Like you, you pre-announce because you're you don't want to you pre-announce to the downside more often than not because you don't want a big surprise for yep. your institutional investors. Like that, that's the whole. Someone, well, why pre-announce in the first place? Uh, that's, I guess, a valid question. But you typically do it so the wind is taken out of the sails. It, you you used to know the whisper number, but the laws changed back after the dot-com implosion, and now supposedly nobody knows, but I believe Goldman Sachs always knows. And so uh, <laughs> this is um, that that. They, how do you lower guidance after pre? Like what you lower that's the insane. Two weeks. Two weeks. Yeah. Uh, it's that, almost as if they pumped it and they wanted to, someone was trying to get out. That is a real, yep. you know what? And if you're, and if not like the SEC listens, I, well, I think the SEC, this is their favorite podcast, Gary Gensler. Hmm. I would look at the calls. I look at the options market around before the pre-announce. If I was, if I was doing some kind of investigative reporting, I would look uh, a week before um see what the options market was doing were they buying the where were they buying calls at was there a big spike in call buying before the pre-announce because and then where did they sell them at probably at the pop right right at the pre-announce and there's probably some nefarious action going on there and and this is this is what drives people out of the markets this is yeah. what app because uh, I was, I, I, as I examine topics, I'll let you pull, I'll pull back the curtain a little bit. As I pull back, as I examine topics for the show to drive the train, one of the topics that always is on my sheet is why does price move the way it does? And I'm constantly trying to solve for that to help explain to stock nerds and market lovers the inner workings of what price, you know, like what drives price movement. Like if you look at this, like, like pick, pick any, uh, give me any stock, Don, pick one stock, I don't care. Uh, let's go with Caterpillar since we bought it today. Yeah, sure. Like you, you could like, okay. So Tim, you just went through this whole thing about, um, inflationary cycle. Hunter, you say that they're directly involved in the mining space. Alex, you told me gold breaking out. Well, why would Caterpillar go down on 430? Like to forget Aaron, is just a, like, why would Caterpillar go down on this day? And there's just so many different external forces affecting the price of a stock that sometimes at the end of the day it's just algorithms and when you when you start to help people understand that it, it's not rigged per se if you know and so you're looking for setups like everything we're doing on the show is you're looking for setups where's your edge how do you get a setup and and how do you know you're wrong right away don how did you know paradigm or teradata tdc because my maximum stop for my entry was 0 0.2 percent of the total owned of the total portfolio, I had a 4% uh, position. So once I was 5% down, that was it. Okay. So you got out. So you took what you deemed to be your edge, your trade, you bought TDC, and then it didn't perform. So you got out. Like, like that's Don took what he believes was a low risk setup to get him maximum gains. And then he's going to minimize his risk. Like once you start looking at the markets, at the end of the day, what we're looking at is the markets in probabilistic natures, uh, natures, nature, like it, like what are the probabilities of this thing moving higher? And if I'm wrong, because it's probabilities and you can be wrong, what's your stop out point? And, and so you're looking for edge, but when you see nonsense like a pre-announce and then they guide lower from the pre-announce, someone needs to get run to prison for a little bit. And, and uh, like, you think I'm being bombastic, but that's bullshit. Yeah. Like it legitimately drives people from the public markets. I, I, and you're like, well, nobody knows what the hell this stock is anyway, Tim. But it happens all the time and nothing's going to change until people are held to account. It's not right. I just I just don't think it's right at all. Sorry. I, Don, what else did you have, man? I just hijacked what you were no, doing. No, you're good. Um Next Lunch and Learn on Wednesday, 526 is going to focus on process improvements. Uh, growth investors, growth stocks have had a really hard uh, time since the middle of February. And we took a, uh, we, we drew down more than we wanted to. And we're doing a deep dive to try to uh, explain um, what we could have done 
we're always focused on a smooth and equity curve as possible for our clients. So would you rather be up 50% and then down 15% or would you rather be up 40% and then down 8%? I think you'd, you'd rather be up 40 and then down eight because of how smooth the equity curve is. So some of the changes are probably would uh, impact the gains to the upside, but one of the um, definite things that will happen is reducing downside risk uh, when the, uh, the two by four that lurks around the corner at all times comes to find. And I mentioned that 0.2%. I used to work on a 0.33% maximum drawdown before a stop would hit, but that 0.2% is something that's going to stick going forward. Okay. Um, tell you what, this is a good spot. Danny, let's do the um, how people can get a hold of us, sign up for that webinar. Um, and then I've got one last thing. Okay. Let's, I tell you what, this is a great right. place. All right, that. folks, listen, if you like what you heard, please tell a friend, tell a neighbor. All of our research is complimentary and free. We're not going to spam them or reach out to them in any way. But if you want to sign up for Don's webinar, over to the right, his Lunch and Learn, over to my right, Tim's left, I guess, is the webinar over there. And that's for Don's Lunch and Learns. He does those about once a quarter, time permitting, for, uh, at, at noon Eastern on a Wednesday. And that's going to be uh, March 26th. So in about three weeks, and uh, even if you can't attend because you're working, if you sign up for it, uh, he'll send you the recorded link. It, however, if you can't attend, then you can. there's a and a so you can ask questions. If you go to the subscribe button, that's how you get this podcast and our uh, daily market insight that we do every day that the market's open. It's a short 10 minute or so video, depending on how inspired the guys are. Um, when the market's open about what we're seeing what we're looking at ideas we're doing uh things we actually did uh you can always email any of us dan at revereasset.com tim at revereasset hunter at revereasset alex at revereasset or don at revereasset.com and you can always call us old school at 855 real well perfect 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 a couple things here real quick um Don, what is uh, what does an IPO base look like? Can you give it to me real quick? Just uh, a stock off the top of your head. I should have asked you prior. It's not fair to Don if you can't come up with it because I'm stalling for you, Don. As you uh, look at but bring up Butterfly BFLY. Sure. I, I if I recall, it formed a base, broke out, and then just did oh, let not. Me, let me just. Yeah, you got to go back uh, further. But is, really, what it is is a cup. You most IPOs. Oh, right here. Um, can you go on a weekly? You're going to sure. see that break out, and then you're going to see it fail. So the the cup is the that's I'm a weekly right going back. Go to yeah. Go to LGVW. That's the same. That's what it was before they yeah. IPO'd. Oh, it won't give it to me. I'm sorry. L give me another L stock. Well, am I still? Uh, I think okay, it's LGVW. Anyway, an IPO oh, base is basically the left side of it would be the high from the open. You sure. uh, then pull back, and then over the course of four to six weeks, you recover and go past the high of the opening day, and gotcha. that would be considered an IPO breakout. Okay. Um, so Facebook what's not 2013? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So what's not happening here, and I feel really bad for folks. This is Coinbase. Yeah, and... that's not forming an IPO base. Right, and so like I. A couple of people have um, on the on the Twitter machine uh, have direct messages like, "Hey, is this an opportunity?" And I just, you know, I don't give you an opinion or advice. I'll never give you advice. Remember, these videos are for your edification purposes only. Never ever be misconstrued advice. One advice, advice, advice. I can only encourage you to reach out to America's fiduciary right here, uh, one Danny Stewart. Um, but just look at this chart. There, there's not anything bullish to say about this chart on a daily or a weekly time frame. And it's so interesting to me that if you go here um, to ARC, and it's gonna, hopefully it comes back up here, Kathy Wood uh, owns, and it's relative to her position size, so she's got about 12% Tesla and ARKK, but she got 1% coin. And I asked Don, he didn't know I was gonna do this, but I asked Don, hey, what is that in relation to the market cap of ARKK? And it's like 210 million. I, I don't know if that makes her the biggest shareholder of coin but if coin does go on a rally she's going to benefit tremendously but right now that is a drag 
on our portfolio. What is ARC uh, up or down for the year? Uh, I believe they're down slightly. Slightly. It, it, yeah. it, they were. Yeah. They had gotten back up to green. Let's see here. They're down no, about they're 10 percent now. Down slightly. Yeah, I think they opened at 124. Now. You're right. Down 10 percent for the back year. Up on the 27th back to being up a tiny bit and then that skin evaporated over the last couple of trading days last seven or eight yeah and this goes along with trade uh, uh you know trying to chase performance and it does, doesn't mean she's less brilliant doesn't mean that our traders and, and, and the whole team at arc aren't brilliant it just sometimes this happens and so um it's just interesting that she i mean there was a time when, and she, it hasn't gone on that recently where um, like last, like up until last week, she had bought coin every day. There was some portfolio buying coin, and, and I found that to be fascinating. And I'm the track. Oh, one thing, so. one thing you've got to remember, and we've been talking about this, is that growth stocks, it, it, the, the market has kind of rotated out of growth stock favor, and we've made some adjustments. We're going to more commodities, caterpillar things like that, things that are working. She can't really do that, I don't believe. She's a technology high yeah. beta growth fund. So in high beta growth, in non high beta growth periods, when high beta growth stocks are out of favor, she's going to get taken to the woodshed. She would have got slaughtered in the tech wreck. Let me, oh yeah, oh yeah. Let me show you the value. She can't just do. She can't do whatever she wants. She can't move the cash. So this she's podcast. a good choice when the growth is in, but when the growth is out, you got to stay away. This podcast provides a tremendous amount of value, and I think. Um, right here on March 27th. And I and this was, and Hunter and I had a, for a peer, we haven't done it in a couple of weeks, um, talked about the the betting stocks, the DraftKings and the Pens. And, um, oh, this is not the podcast, I apologize. It's the March 31st one right here. Uh, two popular stocks may have peaked. And it was the discussion that we had around DraftKings and Penn. And uh, Don, Don hit his, his pain threshold in uh, Teradyne based on a percentage. And there's a technique that uh, I'm pretty fond of, that when you get uh, two closes below, and let me just make sure I got the right daily, the daily chart up here. When you get two closes below the 21 right here, uh, it's probably time to leave the stock. It's a shift in trend often. And you see how it gets stymied here by the 21? You know, that this is DraftKings up uh, above 75, right here is about 65. Now DraftKings is trading off of earnings today. Uh, below 50. Now, I just want to point out some interesting stats about DraftKings because the market cap that's been lost has been fan well. The market cap right now of DraftKings is interesting, and it kind of ties in with what's happened to Peloton. And so Peloton having a up two percent for the day. Look at Peloton. Oh, let me show you Penn before I show you Peloton. I apologize. I'm jumping all over. Yeah, I think uh, I think DraftKings is down about 35 percent from the high. Yeah. Penn down about 42, 43% yeah. from the high. And this is astounding uh, when you think about you just came off of the biggest betting cycle for the, I mean, the big quarter, like you had all of football in March Madness. I mean, like the, the stuff that gets the average better uh, with, with playoffs and this and is that, pretty. That pr the premium that was put on barstool sports during that run up is really yeah. evident when you compare this chart and the DraftKings chart to a chart like CZR, a a typical, um, more a more typical uh, casino stock. I mean that yep. that's near highs. If you you yep. would never think that Penn and Caesar were in the same industry group if you looked at those two. Yeah, yeah pull, and, up, and pull up MGM, Tim. I, yeah. I don't know what it looks like. I'm just curious. Yeah, because they, they're kind of like a hybrid in this regard. Not as good as CZR. And so the the, the online, like MGM's got uh, an online, it's trying to compete with DraftKings. And and mm -hmm. if you look at what the spend is um, for these people to acquire customers, this is a highly competitive space. DraftKings revenue was up $175 million. They guided higher. Like when you look at this DraftKings chart yeah. and you read the quarter, they had uh, the best quarter they've ever had. And this is the reaction to the stock. And it's it all has to do with spend. They're, they have to spend so much, like think three times as much as they make off. The average bet to DraftKings business is $61. You need a lot of money to get that better, to do multiple six, that, that's why they do parlays. That's why I was talking about parlays with Hunter. 
That's the way you get the average and the average better to come in. And if you drain them dry with uh, with uh, all kinds of betting promotions, eventually you run out of money. And this is this, these are very exciting companies in terms of what they what, what they can offer in terms of getting the populace in and the and, and don't think the market isn't taking into account that well tim there's only so much legal gambling going on look all the states are going to do it eventually and the market would forecast this but this is a really bad reaction and i wonder if there's something more systemic going on with a consumer's money flow and how stretched they are well speaking well, of of gambling the in light of the archegos bill wang blow up because of the um margin that was extended to him by several banks a lot of banks are supposedly pulling back on the exposure to a lot of these hedge funds these hedge funds love to load up on gross stocks so the result yeah. is if your credit goes away you've got to liquidate what you're holding yeah this is a but real bad reaction really good points and you've got to separate the company and from the staff, they're not in yep. tandem. Time. Look, those triple D printers, those three D printers, they still are yep. a wonderful product, and you can manufacture all kinds of stuff. They've been a dumpster fire for years. They're so, just now starting to. Yeah. You know. Yeah. So I got a chart of Peloton on the screen, and this is uh, no matter what you think of Peloton, like you love the bike. Uh, they just recalled the treadmills, uh, but this is the uh pandemic stock in my i guess zoom could be too but i i, I think of peloton right now with the, they have real good order flow like they like in terms of people wanting to buy their bikes uh the majority of their bikes by the way this past quarter were sold to people that are making under six figures because they can offer zero percent financing so that that's a big deal um their their streaming classes all the numbers are up but this stock in January had a $50 billion market cap. Today, that market cap is 25 billion. And so like when you get in love with something because you own it or you're Peter Lynching it, and a lot of talk, it's, you know, like Peter Lynch, buy what you own, buy what you know. You know, if you just came in, like once you cross the, the two closes below the 21, and there's a couple of places on this chart you could have kept stuff out of trouble. You just got to get out of the way. And I, I, I share a moving average stock, like a moving average stack screen There's, to just give me the bullish ideas. I share it with all the stock nerds. If you want it, you can have it. Just reach me, Tim at RevereAsset.com, because it'll show me leadership without bias. And I can tell you the stock hasn't been on there at all. But the, the, it's just to quantify how much market cap Peloton has lost, they have lost the amount of one lift, L-Y-F-T, and a DraftKings today. That's how much market cap. They've lost an entire company's worth of market cap, and that's not helping investors right now. I've got, I got one thing to say for you, Tim, just yeah. in, in, in the spirit of non-bias. There, there has been poor reaction after poor reaction after mm -hmm. poor reaction to growth-oriented companies that report really good numbers with, with good yeah. guidance. And it's, I mean, and what's been really interesting is an Often, like DraftKings was up 4% this morning, pre-market. Mm -hmm. And there's initially in the after hours or even in the pre-market, which DraftKings reported pre-market this morning, but there's a good reaction and it gets eviscerated over the course of the next day and then even further eviscerated over the course of the following days. So it's uh, just a yeah. recurring theme that it's like any strength in a lot of these growth names is being sold. And we're seeing a little bit of a, changing character on some names today, but I mean, Roku, Square, they're not holding up the greatest today, even though they were incredibly strong in the after hours of pre-market trading. And, and what you're saying right there, before I go to the charts, what you're saying right there is so pivotal that we just pull that out for a second for people listening. That's a clue. When, when you have great numbers and you can hold your gains, the market's selling the pop. And, my, and it could be for the reason Don stated, I. We'll never know, but that is the market sending you a clue that if, if if the people that control the market don't want your stock, why in hell in God's green earth would you? Because you don't have enough buying power at home to control anything. Do you, do you know what it takes to get it? You see, the, the, the people that control the market aren't pre-marketing DraftKings when it's up 4%. That's you and I. 
most often, but when you're when when the market opens, they tell you what they really think of it. Let, let's look at Roku real quick, and then uh, I'll have Danny take us home here. Let me do uh, ROKU. Yeah, let's let's put this on a five. Oh, wow, rejected at the 21. Yep, they were up almost 18 percent earlier. Yep. Now ran into resistance at the 21, broke through the eight-day exponential, and are trading below it. I mean, but they're still up 12 percent, but they got destroyed over the course of the last three days. Yeah, so really interesting. All right, Danny, I felt like a somber note, but it was just more to, look, man, there's gonna, this market is shifted, it is shifting, and um, uh, hopefully some things at the beginning of the show help you uh, gain a little bit of knowledge about maybe why and, yeah. and what's potentially coming. Those, one important those level to look at, sorry, one important level okay. to look at is the Qs gapped above uh, 334, which is the 21 day exponential moving average, but it's been dripping lower uh, over the last couple of hours and it's now sitting right on the 21. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. All right, Danny, what do you got to say? That's why you can't be biased and you got to follow price. We'll talk to you next week on your money. <laughs>